Member for Vancouver Point Grey. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And uh, I just wanted to begin my remarks uh, in light of the comments uh, made, uh, the detestable uh, comments made by the member for uh, Prince George Mackenzie uh, uh, earlier to, to recognize uh, the, the context in which uh, this bill is presented and, and the opposition's comments. Uh, the member for uh, Vancouver Kingsway spent a significant portion of her adult life fighting for the rights of temporary foreign workers. She's done incredibly uh, proud work that I think makes all of our caucus proud of her efforts. And uh, she's not unique uh, in our caucus, Honourable Speaker. Certainly the member for Burnaby Edmonds, uh, who's done incredible work on behalf of farm workers, uh, vulnerable farm workers, making sure their rights are protected. Many, many members of our caucus have fought for the rights of these very vulnerable workers. And uh, that is the context of the comments that you're hearing from our caucus, concerned about those rights, concerned about protections for workers, and his misrepresentation of that, frankly, uh, unacceptable. Now, Honourable Speaker, I'm, I'm very glad to see that the government's moved to amend uh, the, and formalize the process for the Provincial Nominee Program in British Columbia. This is a very important program for our province, which can and will shape the future of British Columbia. Immigration is incredibly important to the future of our province. We have a huge province with a low population density and incredible opportunity for people who come here. By opening our doors to the best and the brightest in the world, whether they're students or scientists or engineers or doctors or entrepreneurs, we'll ensure a prosperous future for our children. By opening our doors to the vulnerable, we'll teach our children about the value of compassion and the importance of helping others. After all, everyone in this province, except for BC's First Nations, are immigrants to British Columbia. Chinese Canadians worked hard in British Columbia to build our province. Honourable Speaker, I've had the opportunity to read some early accounts of our province, and you cannot read these accounts without coming across descriptions of Chinese Canadians working in British Columbia to build our province, to start businesses, build railways, build buildings, and otherwise help make British Columbia what it is today. South Asian Canadians. A very proud history in my own community of Kitsilano, the first Sikh temple in British Columbia. The importance of that immigrant community to the economic life of Vancouver and British Columbia cannot be understated. My own family uh, benefited directly from immigration policy in Canada and British Columbia. My son's grandfather, my wife's father, uh, was a Scottish immigrant with his family. His parents brought him from life overseas in Scotland to life in Vancouver where they built a family home in Kitsilano and help build British Columbia, as they love to remember, through hard labour. And if I could say it with a Scottish accent, I would, Honourable Speaker. It was a life-changing event for their family, and certainly for me, as I married into that clan. The, the legislation that's before us will hopefully present the opportunity for the province to ask the difficult questions that we need to ask about how we allocate just 5,500 spaces from our federal government for the nominee program. How can we use these very limited spaces to best promote the interests of all British Columbians. Now, there's no question but that the highest and best use of these spaces is not simply to replicate the federal program, requiring new British Columbians to pay fees twice, first to the provincial government and then to the federal government as well. Our nominee spaces should address a gap in the federal program, a chance for us to say British Columbia needs a particular type of person to ensure the success of our province into the future. Too often, the requirements of our program have simply replicated the federal program. This legislation, I hope, will bring in a director who will review that, du that duplication, eliminate it, so these limited spaces are used as constructively as possible. In addition, with a very limited number of spaces, we have to ensure that the manner in which these spaces are allocated is transparent and fair. Demand for immigration to BC far exceeds the number of spaces provided by the federal government to this provincial nominee program by the thousands. New British Columbians should learn from their first contact with our province that we prize, that we value fairness, accountability, and transparency. Now, the federal immigration program posts online their policy manuals for staff so that everybody knows the process by which applications are adjudicated. Our provincial nominee program does not post these staff manuals. It's my hope the new director of this program will address this gap between our two programs immediately upon commencing work. There should be no secret about how these highly sought-after placements are evaluated and administered in British Columbia. Now, most importantly, I think, this new legislation is long overdue on the part of people who come to British Columbia and are frustrated 
with requirements and programs that change seemingly overnight as a result of a posting on a website without the discipline as well as the accountability, both of which are quite frankly limited in this process, of the provincial regulation making process. Now, I spoke with an immigration lawyer today who told me about one of her clients who spent nine months in the low-skilled stream uh, of the provincial nominee program. He worked in a, a very dirty, unappealing job for nine months. And the program said, if you work in this job for nine months, you will be on a path to permanent residence. You'll be able to stay in BC and raise your family here. The man took the promise seriously. He worked the job. He did the job that he wouldn't have otherwise taken. And then the program was cancelled without notice or opportunity for him to complete his permanent residence application. And it's still not clear to him whether he'll be able to be a permanent resident in British Columbia after investing nine months in a low-skilled job in BC for possibly no reason. Now, these kinds of arbitrary and sudden policy changes can destroy a, a family's plans and waste precious time with peop people who don't have that kind of time. They want to be here in BC to help build our province and they're investing the time to do it. It's my hope that this legislation and the new director and the discipline of the regulation making process, rather than simply chase, changing a posting on a website, will reinforce for government the significance of policy changing and the impact that it has on real families and real people in our province. What's notably missing from this act is any mention of penalties for those who have used the program. Presumably the Provincial Offense Act will apply. And we need to think about the importance of penalties and the significance of those penalties for those who abuse this program. What good are the director's new powers of inspection, Honourable Speaker, if he or she cannot impose significant penalties on those who would seek to break the rules for their own financial advantage? I hope the government considers this obvious omission, and I imagine it will be canvassed during the committee stage. Finally, I cannot help but note that the wait lists for immigration for the Entrepreneur Immigration Program are unacceptably long. Now, the people who applied under the entrepreneurial stream in British Columbia in April of 2015 are told on BC's website that it may be as long as three years before their application is adjudicated by the province. Now, this delay in the, in the application process surely jeopardizes the intent of this program. The idea is that if you have money to invest in BC and there's a BC business that needs your investment, that this program connects those people. But three years is obviously obviously completely out of sync with the business cycle in British Columbia today, leading to the obvious question of whether the program is fulfilling its intent. There are serious questions that arise from this delay, and I hope that the new director will address these questions of delay in this unacceptably long wait time. Now, British Columbia is one of the best places in the world to live. We're a province with a strong history and present of First Nations governance, culture, and community shaping our past, our present, and our future. We're a province that has a strong history of immigrants shaping our past and our present and our future. And it's my hope that this bill helps inform our processes so that our immigration program from the day it passes and well into the future continues to strengthen our province. Our diversity and welcoming of people from around the world is our strength. And it's my hope that this bill will help us continue the best of our province's history in that regard. Thank you, Honourable Speaker.